If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. This has been another episode sponsored by Online Horse College. If you haven't had a look at the wide variety of equine-specific accredited courses, then go to onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. I'm excited to introduce our regular guest, Jonna McLean, today. How are you, Jonna? I'm very well, thanks, Bernard. Are you well? Yes, yes. Now, Jonna, we've had you on a few times. We've had you on 042, which was your initial chat. 144, we talked about initial foal handling. Then I think 172, we talked about further foal handling. Then we had a listener's choice because your first chat was so popular. And now we're going to talk about 10 steps for weaning to yearling. Is that right? That's correct. Good. Now, John, this is like a logical progression, isn't it? You've started off with the initial foal handling, further foal handling. It's almost like if someone had a young horse or had a mare that was in foal, they could go through these and you're sort of keeping up with them and then just follow through. It's such a logical progression. It is. I think I think the equation really or the equivalent thing that people can relate to is going from one year of school to another year of school, it should be a natural progression. And, yep. of course, um, that's how we'd like it to be for the horse because the more stress-free it is for the horse, the more capable it is of learning, mm-hmm. and therefore it's a, a, it becomes a far more confident, responsive, and reliable, and therefore predictable horse. Good. Yep, yep, yep. All right, so with our first steps, we're going to talk about how weaning occurs in the wild because we're going from weaning to yearling. So would you be able to talk about weaning in the wild? And this would be not particularly Australia, but any country, wouldn't it? Any country, any group of horses, any horses that are not interfered with by man. It's exactly right. So we're talking about completely uh, naive horses, that horses that have been left to their own devices and surviving themselves in the wild without any interruptions from us at all. Mm-hmm. So the background to this essentially is that when a mare has a foal, of course it has to uh, raise the foal and the foal becomes a little bit more mobile and a little bit more dexterous and then a little bit more capable of foraging for, for vegetable matter, grasses, and et cetera, et cetera, and it becomes a little bit more worldly and it becomes a little bit more uh, able to then become part of the social network or the, or the, the, the part of the family group. And that's really, and in my earlier interviews, I talked a lot about really making sure that the degree of um, touching and the contact that we have with, with horses is such an essential part. I mean, a lot of people probably call it trust, but I would call it really just bonding so that the horses, uh, the foals or whatever they are, or whatever age group, become really comfortable with our presence and really comfortable with the things that we would like to be able to do with them and for them. Mm-hmm. So in, as a background to that, essentially what happens then as the uh, foal gets older and it gets towards, um, there's no actual weaning stage. Weaning is something that we've all manufactured. The weaning process, we would like to think, is when mum doesn't see the foal anymore or the foal isn't able to suckle mum anymore or it is completely independent. Now, we've created this opportunity because people are in so much of a hurry. And so we soon realise that if we are able to wean our foals, you know, sometimes as early as six months, I've I've known it to be very, very early right through to, let's say, a a yearling, almost uh, being a year old, then these horses in the wild simply are pushed away by the mere fact that the mare has now had another foal and that new foal now needs to suckle. So therefore, she will actually try to defend her newborn and the other one will be pushed to the outer. It will still be there, but it'll probably just be with the other yearlings. So it'll be around and there'll be some mutual grooming goes on and there'll be, um, you know, they will still travel along in a herd um, when they're going from place to place. But the foal will be very, very close to her and the horse that is was a weanling that is now a yearling, is still part of the family group and is still there. So the reason I wanted to mention that as the first point is that 
in an ideal world, wouldn't it be marvellous if we could actually do that and still have the things that we require? And I believe that we can, but not many people really practice it as such, where they just let their horses be born and, and then raised by the family group and then caught or trained and, and to do what we would like them to do. Mm. Because, we're, as I said, we're in so much of a hurry. But it's still possible because if we have our weanling or our potential weanling in the stable, then we would like to be able to then say, maybe what we could do, there are various ways of doing it. You can have a group of mares and take one mare out each day or each week or whatever you think you could do, but that runs a risk because then the foal would then want to suckle another mare and then that foal may kick that foal and then we have an extra problem. So I think keeping this as a background and keeping the horses so that they can see each other and maybe not touch each other, but certainly see each other. So we might have two weanlings together in a paddock and then two mares in a paddock that they can see and hear one another. Then the weaning process or the stress upon the weaning process is reduced. Therefore, the horse is much more responsive to future training and tactile inputs from people, etc., etc. And I noticed this only yesterday. I was doing a couple of weanlings up the road yesterday and the moment I changed the situation where I put the mare and the foal in a yard, then I put another mare and foal in a yard, and I've been working them for three days in the stable, and everything was going beautifully. I couldn't have wished it to be better. It was really lovely. I put them in the yard. All of a sudden, both of them said, no, I can't be caught in here because I changed <laughs> the context. Okay. We only have to change the context a little bit, and all of a sudden it upsets our grand plans of saying, yes, well, by Friday I have to go and do this, and I would like to mares and foals to be separated by Thursday. We're always in such a great hurry when really it always goes better if we let the outcomes dictate the time frame, not the money and not the time. Yes, yes. And I think that's a good lesson, isn't it, to let the outcomes dictate the time frame? Well, it is because, I mean, at the end of the day, what staggers me, Glennis, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just saying this as a, as, a, as a general thing, as a generalisation, but we tend to discover what we need to do as professional horse handlers, which is told to us by the owners because they have a time frame, they have an agenda, they also have a budget as well. However, I wonder how much of that every time we are asked to compromise those things, how much do we then tax the future outcomes and the future trainability and affect the temperament of the horse because of that outcome? Mm -hmm. I wonder that. Yep, yep. We put all that time and money into all these horses. <laughs> we and do. We compromise at the most critical point. I can't yes. believe it. Yes, yes. Okay, now as part of this process, this brings us to point number two, is to check that the pressure release directions are obedient, which is something that you've covered, you know, right the way through. But Many times. Yes, mm. yes. So can you talk about what would be expected at this level then? At this level? At this, at this age, I should say. At, at this age, as I've pointed out in my previous interviews, if your pressure release systems are very, very light, responsive and obedient, all, all being the same thing, because if they're light, they're, they're obedient, um, and then we're able to say, okay, at the time of the pressure, do your legs move frontwards? At the time of the pressure, do your legs move backwards? And then we can say, okay, now can you walk and keep walking? So now we're talking about saying, can you um, have some degree of, degree of self-carriage of the tempo of the walk? In other words, the foal will keep walking by itself. Separation has now been a little bit exposed because the mare is in the box when we're maybe leading the weanling up and down the aisle in whatever situation. Then we can stop. Then we can also start to explore parking, which is a permanent state of stop, which basically means, as it sounds, that when we say stand, the foal, the weanling will stand until we say otherwise. And generally speaking, no matter what tends to happen in the background with the mare, she might be um, eating or she may move around in the box or whatever, it shouldn't have a grand effect upon the status of park. This is probably one of the most important areas that I look at, not just in riding horses, but also in young stock, is they understand that Stop means stop until told to do otherwise, which is park. But it means that then we can then use our other parts of our knowledge in habituation techniques in getting our weanling exposed to rugging, grooming, not moving when I groom, not moving when I rug, not moving when I um, do other things to you. And it's always a flight response that is our undoing. So 
the relationship between not having park and having the flight response are very, very closely linked. So you'll either have one or the other. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, I think that's an important lesson and this is brought on. I mean, you're talking about weanling to yearling at this stage and we haven't even talked about riding, but you're still talking no. about a flight response, you know, but you're introducing it, things at this age in preparation to riding. That's right, exactly, because it ends up not being breaking in at all. It ends up being a continuum of what we've talked about mm. and there's no difference. All we're doing is going from basic arithmetic through to more complex arithmetic because the foundations are exactly the same. Yep, yep, yep. So it's easy, it's so easy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, something else that, that this is point number three, and I'm not sure that you did it so explicitly in the earlier, but you're training forehand and hindquarter yield to pressure. Yes, and this is where I, and the reason I start to do this is because I would like to be able to dictate independent manoeuvrability control systems over the front end compared to the back end. Mm-hmm. And we will talk more about this if I'm invited back on to talk about when we do breaking you, in. You'll be invited but, back um, on, that's for sure. <laughs> You've got too I, much information I, I, for us, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the manoeuvrability is really just saying that when I apply pressure to the shoulder and we can use a whip, we could use a stick, we can use a hand. But we're basically asking the, uh, the weanling now just to take a single step away from the pressure in a particular direction. So if we're, if we're um, standing on the near side of the weanling and we apply pressure to the near shoulder, then the front legs take one step to the right, or at least one leg takes one step to the right, and then we can apply another piece of pressure to the same point and then ask the other leg to come towards it. We call that abduction and adduction. So basically bring the legs together or making them go apart depending on which leg moves. We do the same for the hindquarter. But the beauty about this is is that once they understand the concept of moving away from pressure with the front end and the back end independently of one another, then when we have a problem such as going across a creek, loading onto a float, going into a crush, going in in, in all these areas, it is nearly always the first thing that happens when a horse doesn't want to go somewhere, there's a decrease in tempo and stride length, and then there's a change in in line, in other words, the direction that you want the um, animal to travel in. And therefore, if you apply increased rein pressure and the horse has lost its line, then you're actually not getting your weanling or, or your animal to go where you want, so there could be a potential accident. Okay. So what we're avoiding here is making sure that the shoulders specifically, more interested in the shoulders and the hindquarter. The hindquarters are useful, of course, being able to manoeuvre them, but the shoulders specifically are important in loading into a horse load, into a crush where space is at a premium and we have to load them carefully step by step so they don't have an accident, they don't scare themselves, and then they don't associate us doing it to them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right. Now, you talked about working them independently, but number four is sort of along those lines. It's being suspicious of a decreasing degree of the responsiveness. Yes. And and I, I could have put this in one of the 10 tips as well. I, I could have gone either way this one because being aware of a decreasing responsiveness, and I haven't talked about that, and that's why I put it in is because if we do too many repetitions with the one thing, it's like us doing too many push-ups. We get too tired to respond adequately. Or if we start to overface a horse with a more complex question that it doesn't understand, that will also occur. So there are two things that can happen. Either the application of the cue is insufficient or, in other words, there isn't enough pressure applied to be able to for the horse to interpret what we would like them to do or they've done too many and they're starting to get too tired. So identifying decreases in responsiveness in any aid or any cue, it's important at that point to think, well, I must always first blame myself, number one, so therefore maybe I've done too many or the question is too hard. Let's go back to what he or she can do. Let's go back a step. So we go back a step and we check out some other things. We might have a little bit of a, a, bit of a break, a bit of time out, let the weanling have a bit of a walk around in the box while we have a cup of tea or whatever, and then come back in and say to ourselves, what could I have done to have broken this down into a more simple step-by-step and ask this question in a more simple way? If we can answer that question and the answer is, yes, I can do it simpler, well, that answers the question. But if 
our weaning is a little bit too tired to respond, then we've just given him or her a little bit of time to be able to gather the energy to be able to respond, and in which case I would just get maybe two or three good responses in a row, and then I would move on to a different topic or finish the session. Mm -hmm. But we have to be careful that if we allow the decreasing responsiveness to occur, then we are almost, can I say, habituating them to the aid, in other words, becoming used to the pressure, and that's not what we want. We want a reaction because habituation is about not having a reaction. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, yes. Wait, can you hear anything? No? That's because we're waiting for someone with a good quality horse product to be advertised here. If that's you, then contact us, horsechats at horsechats.com, and we'll send you the details. Thanks. Now, something else that you're bringing in, and I don't know that you've you've talked about it before, is the self-carriage, because you're talking about a horse going faster and slower and staying in self-carriage. So can you explain a bit about what you mean by self-carriage before we talk about the faster and the slower? Yes. This is probably one of the most powerful tools that I have in my toolbox for not just a re-education, if we call it that, but future training, ongoing training, whatever terms we like to use. But it means this is when pressure release training, operant conditioning systems become classical. It's at this point, this is one of the first places that we actually discover how marvellous it is to deal with horses because when we are able to motivate our horse to go frontwards from our leg cue, then our ambition is to be able to reduce the number of times we use our leg cue. Therefore, our horse, our riding horse, simply keeps walking all by itself until told to do otherwise. And you've heard, everybody's heard me say that. Yep. You've got to keep doing this and do otherwise, whether it be park or walking. Mm-hmm. So what we're looking at here is two, two factors. The speed of the walk or the tempo, the rate of the walk, um, and the line and the direction in which we're going in. And then we do absolutely nothing absolutely nothing we bear light and we try to melt into the uh, universe as if we were not there still in the same position riding really really carefully very very still and then see what happens and the moment the tempo slows down then you do a little reminder and say no no you've got to keep walking and get that reaction nice and quickly within a second a second and a half or so but you know not not harshly not to scare the horse but to encourage them not to slow down and then see how long that lasts for and gradually, surely train that the response is if I ask you to walk at, say, 55 beats a minute, you'll keep walking at 55 beats a minute until I turn and even when I turn, it still has to be 55 and even when I circle or even if I change rein. And that then means that we're not doing anything. We're just actually sitting in the cockpit like a pilot monitoring systems that's all we're doing we're not having to pull knobs and and push pedals we're not having to do any of that we're actually just really enjoying our horse Mm -hmm. because we've now trained it to have an element of cruise control or a self-carriage state of speed in line yep yep hugely powerful for breaking in that's where Uh where i'm going with this yes yes yeah absolutely the next one we're going to talk about, because we're talking about self-carriage in park, because successful habituation to touch, so legs, head, mouth, and private parts, and keeping yes. the horse in self-carriage in park. This is number six. This is number six. And, of yep. course, you know, every time we have a horse, we have a problem with it. It gets sick, and then we have to see the vet, or it's got a crack in its foot, and it has to see the farrier, or sometimes it goes so badly, we have to have them all present at once, and... The horse is a little scared and a little worried about what's going on because these procedures are still relatively new. So being able to develop that degree of self-carriage means that this is our troubleshooting reference point, that if we can create immobility to the point where the horse stands by itself so it's a self-carriage apart, then it's going to be far easier to be able to feel the minor resistances when minor resistances in violation of park when, for example, we lift their tail and we put a thermometer on their bottom or we wish to open their mouth, we'll feel those resistances travel down the lead rope because there is no pressure holding the horse there because you've trained it. Therefore, the very first cue you get will be a little bit of pressure. Therefore, we are more able to be able to make sure that we are safe and the horse's welfare is looked after by making everybody aware, including the horse, that that is not the desirable thing that we want to happen. Yep, yep. All right. Now, last time you talked a little bit more about leading 
you talked about going, you know, over different obstacles. And I'm not sure if we talked about loading or preparation for loading. So you're talking now, this is number seven, about it becoming a predictable state, leading, loading in common areas and various conditions. That's right. And we talked about the common areas leading out of the breezeway and up a grassy bank and practicing halting in different places and maybe reversing over different surfaces once they're confident walking forward. The whole thing here is that once I have the self-carriage state or the walk speed trained well enough, then I'm that tells me that I'm ready to start doing obstacles. And it's exactly the same as training a cross-country horse for, for, for eventing. Mm-hmm. Because once the horse is actually able to canter over a log at a speed without too much fuss, then it's much more able to then to negotiate something different, and this is the same. So we're now saying, now walk maybe up to the tailgate. Now can you stop? And now when you stop... Can you lean down and sniff the tailgate and just get the horse to sniff the tailgate, touch the tailgate? It doesn't matter if they bite it or lick it or whatever, that's fine. And then quietly ask them with, a, with another forward cue, say, now put your foot where your nose was. So we're now encouraging the horse to explore putting its feet on the tailgate. The tailgate isn't noisy, it's well secured, it's got good grip, it's obviously not wet. Then with the horse's head down lower, they're much more able to put their feet where their noses are. And you'll notice most horses that are actually at the front of a herd when they're going somewhere that's a little bit different or a little bit worrisome, the horses that will be out the front will be the horses with their heads down, noses flared, taking in as much information as possible, smelling, looking, hearing, touching, and then stepping forward. And mm-hmm. That's exactly how we get the first step onto the horse float. And then we say, well, that was a very good step with the rough wall, and you put your foot on the tailgate. Now go back a step. Now come forward and get that leg to go onto the tailgate quicker. So mm-hmm. in other words, start to get that single step happening from a lighter pressure. Yep. And then when yep. that occurs predictably, then the other leg and then away you go. Okay. So it's all about maintaining line and tempo onto new surfaces and then applying it to the horse float. Yes, and about one step at a time and repeating that step yes. until you get it better. Yep. Yeah. Yes, I, I mean, I don't I don't worry, and I, I don't think I've ever had a client ever say to me, oh, yes, I would like my horse I'm loaded onto the horse float today. Mm. Because mm. the way that I say, well, I don't know what the horse is going to do towards your horse float, and, and the clients are always, you know, everybody's pretty pretty aware of what goes on with horses. And so well, let's just see how far we go today, and if we find we end up going too long and the horse is a little bit tired, well, that's okay. We'll, we'll come back again tomorrow. But it will happen at the speed in which we can try and keep the horse's fear as as low as possible. Therefore, we're reducing the likelihood of anything slightly left field happening to the horse or, or to us. I'm thinking too, Jonna, that earlier on in the chat, you said let the outcomes dictate the time frame when you're training. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. Let the outcome dictate the mm. Absolutely. And that's, mm. I mean, that's one of the reasons still to this day, I don't, still don't wear a watch when I teach. I yes. don't. I don't train. I don't teach for forty-five minutes. I train response per response per response, and then away you go. So it's actually completely dictated by how well the horse is able to understand the first set of signals, and then maybe refreshing a few other ones, and then if you need to, start putting them together into a sequence. Yep. Yep. And that's what dictates. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Now, number eight. We're talking a bit about pole yields and tying up. We're checking that the reverse step can quickly oh. change to a forward step without dramatic increases in lead pressure. Yep. And you heard me just say this before as when I was walking up to the tailgate with the weanling or the foal, that when I lower my hand, the horse follows my hand down yes. and sniffs the tailgate. Yes. I train all horses to lead. Once mm-hmm. they're light in their, in their go and they're light in their stop and then they're light in their reverse, then I can say, oh, halfway through your backward step, excuse me, I've changed my mind, come forward. And if there's no head raising and that leg or that near fore leg was about to travel through the air in a reverse step, and then I can apply pressure to it. And as quick as I apply the pressure, the horse's leg then changes its flight immediately and goes forward. So I can then start to say, oh, whoops, no, sorry, not backwards a step, forward a step. So I'm actually training the horse when its legs go backwards I can change its mind by changing the cue. So the cue might be, you know, the, the pole strap or, or bridle or, or, or whatever we're using. That cue then will change the legs immediately. That factor right there, when I can go stop, yep. go, stop, back a step, now go again, 
once I can do that transition, it's the same as just as once you can do rain back and then go with no hesitation, you don't get pole, the head and neck coming up. You actually get the opposite. You almost get a reaching of the neck. Mm-hmm. Then you'll be able to say, okay, now if I apply my hand straight downwards, so there's three basic directions that the horses need to know other than turn, and that is stop means slightly backwards, and then the same cue again applied once they're backwards should produce a reverse step, and then slightly forward underneath the chin should mean come forward. And then we're saying now straight down means lean down and touch it. And the instant the foal, the weanling horse touches the object, then I scratch them in, you know, on the nape of their neck or their wither and say, good boy, or, you know, make a bit of a fuss and let him scratch it and touch it. And, of course, I'm almost inviting him to fiddle with the object at the start by scratching him because you'll notice that when you put your hand out underneath a horse's muzzle and you scratch them, their noses start to become really active and they start to rub and scratch you, mutual grooming Mm -hmm. responses. Yes. And so if you do that, then you're encouraging the horse up to any object that is safe to do so, to go up and touch it, and then you'll get a scratch. So now I've turned the horse around from being scared to being curious, mm. and that is a really powerful tool. So, oh, look at that log, and the horse called prick its ears, and look at the log and say, oh, that's a good log. We should walk up and touch that. Oh, yeah, and he chews a bit of the wood. That's fine. He's not scared of it. And the moment he touches it and chews it or licks it, and then you lead him away, I almost guarantee you every time they won't shy away from it when you lead them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because they're confirming that it's not scare that's not a scary situation by first of all seeing it. There's no sound coming from it, and now they've touched it, so they can smell it, touch it, taste it, and with those three senses, they've confirmed that it's not a threat. Okay. Okay. Good. If you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor, or even if you aspire to be one, have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the Horse Chats website. Go there now. Have a look. Horse Chats. All right. Now, earlier we talked a little bit about that first step onto a float. And for people overseas, to a float is a trailer. So, you know, thinking about loading a horse or loading a horse onto a truck or a lorry or, you know, whatever, we've got to think about that. Yeah. Thank you for that reminder. (laughs) That's all right. Now, so loading on a float or a lorry or a trailer is proof of leading. So we're talking about now how to do the transitions on and off the float, how to teach that, and like whenever you decide so that it parks there and ready to go. The ultimate, of course, is to be able to throw the lead rope over your horse's neck, point it at the at the bay that it is meant to go in, and let's say we're using a horse float, and we are very careful with our approach here and making sure that the traction is sorted and everything's sound and the line is good. And then we give a little go response with the lead wrap and the horse just walks up pretty much all the way to the chest bar and stands there. That's where we'd like to end up. But in order to do that, we have to almost train self-carriage of walking, the self-carriage state of walking to the point where the horse will actually keep walking even if we stop. Mm -hmm. And at that point that once you can train that, that you may have to put into place a slightly different cue in a different location because now you can't lead your horse all the way up to the chest bar because there may be a centre divider that extends out to stop horses touching one another when they're in transport. So you're going to have to train them to cast at least a couple of steps. So we can do that by adding a separate cue anywhere you like, preferably somewhere behind the girth. Uh, it would be nice to say near where your leg goes, but in a horse like that's not possible because there's a divider there. But we'll train with the float being completely open at the start and say, now walk up, stand, back a step, forward, back to where you were. That was good. Now we'll take another step forward and we'll continue that till we're at the chest bar. Okay. And then the next one is that if we can then ask our horse, let's say we're just using a, a whip uh, a whip tap um, on the horse's uh, anywhere uh, on a, you can use it on its rump or on a, on its uh, thoracic area if that, if you have access to that area, depending on the height of the horse and the, and the configuration of the float largely. But train that outside first and train a go response from the uh, – uh, you might do a little touch with the lead rope and then a little tap-tap with the with the stick or the, or the dressage whip, just tap-tap. And so now two taps should make you go. Yes, it does. Now we'll do that in the float. And then when the horse hesitates, you can just go tap, tap. 
and the horse will then, or the weanling or the foal or the horse will then walk forward and then do nothing, keeping the whip close to the sight. And the moment they go backwards, you can just go, ah, no, tap, tap, and step forward. And that's the time when the horse is saying, oh, I really would like to exit now. And that is giving you the measure of how long you should park there for until you should then say, righto, now back a step, tap, tap, stop, back a step, tap, tap, stop. So I can come out one step at a time. Then I'm in a position where I can go back a step, tap, tap, stop. Good boy. And I can scratch him with the whip by using it like a violin on his on his rump. So I can use it as a cue and I can also use it as a as a as a tactile reinforcer by scratching with the with my whip. And I'll give him a little bit of scratch with the whip on my hand and say, mm-hmm. Good boy. Oh, by the way, now walk forward. So the hardest one for all horses and the yardstick really is, especially for the horses that rush out especially for the horses that bang their heads on the horse float, or you think they might because they're quite large, is getting that forward cue from behind the saddle, uh, from behind where the saddle will ultimately go, um, towards the rear of the horse, and training that outside, separate from the horse float, enables you then to arrest that running out backwards uh, behaviour. And then we can step out one step at a time, park, scratch, forward a step, back two steps, tap, tap, stop, scratch, good boy, and I have complete control over the exit. Because when you don't, then the horse links, escape, and then fear. Mm, mm, mm. Let's just do a 9A, if you like, or just a little bit of a sidetrack, because you have talked about, you know, using the whip and the tap-tap and how you're using it. But can you talk a bit about the type of whip and also how it's used to support your other aids? That's a really good question. I'm glad you asked these questions, Clarence, because I would have thought of these things after after we'd finished the conversation. <laughs> well, I'm just thinking if someone's <laughs> listening and they, they think, oh, well, you know, Jono's got the whip out, well, you know, why are you, exactly. yes, yes, why are you using yes. the whip and what type of whip and, yeah. yeah. The whip is an extension of my hand and it's not used for punishment purposes. It's used as a, a way of being able to reach a site on a horse to deliver a cue for example, a hind quarter step, or in this case, I'm using it for forward. So it's an extension of my hand. So it's quite easy. I'll walk into a horse shop and I see thousands and thousands of whips every year. And I can pick up a whip and straight away I can feel if it's heavy or if it's really waggly or if it has a really long tassel on it, I try to avoid those sorts of whips. The reason being, as I said, I need it to be direct and I need it to stop wobbling exactly when my hand stops. and I would really like it to be able to be light enough that when I hold it with my index finger pointing towards the end of the whip, so I'm holding the shaft almost along my wrist, that I can be very accurate with the sight, the pressure, and how many taps I do and where. And I'm very, very particular about this. So heavy whips are difficult. They're clumsy. So I'm just after something that's Pretty stiff, not much whippiness in it at all, and with no tassel. Yep. Okay. Okay. All right. Now that we've done that bit of a sidetrack, we can go on to number 10. So we're talking now about just seeing what's well established to do with, you know, habituation to towels, grooming, and talking about rugging and leading or leading with, with the rugs. Oh, and the other thing is too, when we say rugs, we might need blankets. Yes, exactly. See, we've we've done all our toweling and so the most important part here is really making sure that our young horse, or I should say our naive horse, because it doesn't apply to any horse, is that whether it be a sheet for summer or a rug for winter and it's a combo or it's a canvas rug or whatever it is, is that we make sure that when we do apply it that the horse isn't worried about it. So we might start applying it in a particular way that is going to start to mimic what we're ultimately going to do because ultimately we just throw our rug on our horse. And lots of people, unless they, and this is, I still do this to this day, I really make sure that my backward step is right there. So I have my horse in a head collar and a lead rope and I do a little backward step and then I'll apply the rug. Mm-hmm. And I do that so that then I can almost guarantee that I've got some degree of park before the rug goes through the end lands on the back making sure that they're facing into the wind because there's nothing worse than having a sheep being thrown and then the wind grabs it and it throws it completely over the horse's head and it all goes haywire. We've all done that. We don't want to be in that situation. So making sure the horse is facing into the wind and then we can do our straps up 
as we have been taught to properly and safely. And then we want to discover in the round yard or in the stable even or in the breezeway that the horse is now feeling comfortable enough to walk freely and all the leading states that we've trained are not affected or compromised because of the sound of the rug, the look of the rug, the feel of the straps and the fit of the rug. Mm-hmm. Okay, good. So you're saying that by now, by the time the horses are yearling, it's all well established. It is all established. And this is what I was doing with our yearlings the other day. They're pretty advanced. We can throw their lead rope over their neck and they cast into a horse foot and they can have a rug on. But now we're able to say, okay, what happens if I sprinkle sand on the rug in the sand roll? Does that make a noise? And that noise, you when you put sand on a horse rug, it sounds a little bit like Velcro doing up and undoing. And you notice a lot of horses don't like Velcro. Mm-hmm. So I can mimic stuff and mimic those sounds with something simple and easy. But I know that the very first opportunity that the horse will get to be able to escape that sound may exist. So I'll just check that my stop is good and then my backward step is good before I do that because I always want to be ahead of the game. That's 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 my job. I need to make sure that I've got plan B covered. All right. So much of horses is all about plan B, isn't it? <laughs> yes, yes it is. Yes, it is. Mm. John, and this is for all, for the initial foal handling, the further foal handling and the weaning to yearling, if people would like to talk to you about that, what's your contact details? My contact details at the moment are johnmclean at gmail.com. And I've launched my website now, which is good. good. This is up and going now, which is traintowinequitation.com.au or traintowinracing.com.au. And I also have a email address for that, but we'll just keep it simple at this stage. Okay. So we'll just use my normal Gmail account to start things off because it's all new. I'm still tweaking things, of course, or we yeah. are still tweaking things. Good, and once good. we get that, or I, I should say I get more organised. It's about me getting more organised. <laughs> <laughs> all right, then. Jonna, thanks again for coming to talk to us again. And what do you think you'll be talking about next time? It's a good question because from here on, if we continue all these processes that we've talked about, Dennis, from, we've gone from weaning and it's now a yearling. We've now put in the safeguards because the yearling is the most dangerous animal, I believe, to handle because it's powerful, it's fast, it's nearly three quarters of what it's going to be in terms of its grown weight, Mm -hmm. potentially. Some of them are, some of them are quite large, as you know, you don't have to go to the yearling south to see that. Um, However, I can't say that we are three quarters down the educational track and the best safeguard we have for our own safety and a horse's welfare is a well-trained, powerful horse. So I think that from the yearling stage, we could go down the yearling stage, but I'd be more keen to start to go down. It's going towards maybe some of the things that we can do as a precursor to breaking in that will make the person breaking in the horse make his job a whole lot easier and better potentially. So we can sort of gloss over the the yearling side of it and go more towards the two-year-old stage. I know some people would like to break in their horse when they're three and four and five, but we can. it doesn't matter when these things are applied as long as the horse is safe to handle. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right, that's wonderful. John, I'm looking forward to talking to you again and thanks again for coming on and talking to us about the 10 steps to go from weaning to yearling. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Glenn, and thank you for asking the questions that I often get to ask. <laughs> okay, bye. Bye. Now, if you're still there, you probably know that I'm absolutely passionate about education within the horse industry. That's why I host this podcast. My other venture is Online Horse College. Have a look now at onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below.